Funding for Arkansas's First People is provided in part by the We Shall Remain Community Coalitions Grant through American Experience and these generous organizations. Tales from Arkansas's past have been as rich and varied as its people. Family stories, historical accounts, folklore, and scholarly evaluations all play a part in history. Our earliest ancestors had names not easily recognized, not easily spoken. The Paleo, Archaic, Woodland, and Mississippian Indians. Their stories start with the objects and artwork they left behind. Ingenious tools and unique pottery surface after being buried for centuries. Sky-reaching mounds dot the Arkansas landscape. Curious pictures painted and packed onto rock surfaces reveal the intelligence and humor of Arkansas's first people. Hate no one, 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 hate no one. Archaeology is the study of material things and places where the mark of mankind is visible. It discovers traces of structures from villages and images left on rocks. Archaeologists search for patterns that speak of ancient people's lives. Very few things from the past can without question identify a specific tribe or culture. Experts say they can only form hypotheses. Unfortunately, the histories that have been written and the average citizen's understanding of who came before the Anglo-European settlers after the, the uh, Louisiana Purchase and what their lives were like is still pretty vague and unfortunately in the past has suffered from some imagination rather than search of original documents or encounters with the descendants of those people. In addition to that, average citizens have a number of stereotypes in their head about American Indian people and some of that gets mixed up with their expectations of the native people who once lived in Arkansas. Stories of American Indian culture in Arkansas begin with ancient people who spread out across the North American continent, some filtering down into the Mid-South as they followed wild game along the rivers and plateaus. The only name we know these people by is Paleo. Paleo means old and Paleo-Indian refers to a specific time period from 13,500 years or so ago up until about 10,500 years ago. Their day-to-day -day activities probably consisted of a great deal of preparation and uh, manufacturing things. Uh, not so much the stone tools, because they don't take so long to make, but things like their spear shafts, clothing. Uh, we know they had very well-tailored clothing because these people came from an area in, um, in uh, Asia where it was extremely cold and we know they probably had really well uh, prepared clothing that was tailored not just some you know bunch of Spanish moss thrown on their bodies. Um, we know that uh, they had kids and had to raise their kids, and they're teaching their kids all the time how to do things, just like we do today. Child or adult, in order to do a job, tools play a part. Arkansas has plenty of resources and the Washita Mountains are full of stone used in the early technology of Arkansas's first people. The cool, glassy surface of Navaculite 
was chipped and flaked into everything from spear points to axe heads, used for hunting and everyday chores. Well, flint napping is a worldwide phenomenon. It, it happened everywhere that there was rock and rock that would break in the right way to produce a sharp edge. And it was probably discovered very quickly that the sharp edges of flint could cut meat, uh, vegetable matter, plants, and, and other things that had to be cut probably before with a bone or just by smashing or grinding or some other primitive method. But when you flint nap, you're taking a rock that's high in silica, which is much like glass, and you're removing small flakes and large flakes from it in a structured way to shape it. Making tools for chores isn't the only thing we have in common with our early ancestors. Images are universal forms of self-expression. Here in the Arkansas River Valley, symbols have been found in caves and on rock ledges. Some experts agree that the Ozark Plateau may hold important symbols of past cultures and even the doodlings of ancient artists. Some people think rock art is the designs and artwork that's on record albums produced by rock and roll artists, but uh, anthropologists and archeologists use the term to uh, describe images that people paint onto natural rock surfaces or carve in, or engrave into natural rock surfaces. The painted images are called pictographs and the carved or engraved or pecked images are called petroglyphs. Okay, so it's, it's part of the pictograph. Right? Oh, okay. It's a combination of petroglyph and pictograph. Technique uh, doesn't lend itself to very fine uh, artistic application. Uh, many other Native American art forms uh, uh, allow for much finer detail. Rock art painting or, or carving is a somewhat cruder mechanism, uh, so the images are more generalized. Uh, they're often quite not as attractive, but they're very important because they do reflect some very interesting motifs that uh, provide glimpses into the worlds uh, that ancient peoples uh, saw or imagined. Some of those worlds had small rises or obvious towering hills popping up along the flat expanse of the Grand Prairie and Mississippi Delta. Mounds built by Arkansas's first people are earthen pyramids Newer generations have wondered if they were used for practical reasons or to reach a higher power. Hi everybody, my name is Amy and I'm a park interpreter here at Toltec Mounds Archaeological State Park. The first thing you need to know is Toltec is a misnomer. The Toltec Indians from Mexico did not come up here and build these mounds. The people who did build these mounds, we call the Plum Bayou culture. They built 18 mounds in total. Today, you will only see three original mounds. The Plum Bayou culture primarily lived at the time of the late woodland period. At this time, Native American cultures started making pottery, building burial mounds, domesticating wild plants, and making ceremonial and social centers such as this one at Toltec. Native builders used baskets of dirt to form the layers of mounds. Over time, new layers were added. It's believed that the new layers may have been used to bury their dead, cover up leftover scraps from meals or work, or some seem to mark a specific point inside the site with a specific purpose. Mounds at Toltec and other sites are unique in height, shape, and use. The 
there's different kinds of mounds. The first type are very large mounds that are flat on top. Mounds that they have lived on or had ceremonial structures built. The second type are ceremonial mounds. Mounds such as S and H. H is a key mound in their calendar system. If you were to stand on mound H and the sun set, in a certain place, they knew when to plant and harvest their crops. If you were to stand on Mount H and the sun set over Mount B, that would be the summer solstice. If the sun set over Mount A, that would be the fall or spring equinox. And if the sun set over Mount S, that is the winter solstice. Not only did they have the sun sets, but they also had the sun rises. If you stand on Mount 8, and the sun rose over Mount B, that would be the summer solstice. If the sun rose between C and G, that would be the winter solstice. And if the sun rose over mound H, that would be the fall or spring equinox. E is also an important mound. If you were to stand on mound E at night and look over mound A, you would find the North Star. The third type of mound is like Mound C. It has been known to be a burial mound. Burial mounds are round or conical on top. Here at Toltec, Mound C is more like a mysterious mound. We have found human remains around Mound C but not on Mount C. You may be thinking, why don't you excavate Mount C and find out? The answer is, Congress passed a law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Since they passed this law, archaeologists can no longer dig for human remains. Toltec Mounds is a site for repatriation, one of the only ones in Arkansas. Repatriation is the reburial of human remains in a sacred or protected place. Because of land development and farming, American Indian remains surface and are at risk of being destroyed. Farming was the largest component of the uh, Mississippian period. Uh, these people produced hundreds of acres of corn and squash and beans and some of the tools that they used were these massive chert holes behind me here. And it's also well representative of the trade network. We have Mill Creek chert represented here from Southern Illinois. We have Dover chert from uh, Western Tennessee. Also representative is uh, side notched holes and grinding stones. They also made effigy vessels, not only of humans, but also representing agricultural uh, practices as well as effigy vessels of animals and fish, flora and fauna that was important to them in their everyday lives. Other aspects of the trade network that existed was items of personal adornment. We have a wonderful collection of shells from the Gulf Coast, copper bracelets, stone gorgets. This was all an important part of the Mississippian lifestyle. The mound builder settlements are scattered across eastern Arkansas. These artifacts are traces of past lives that give more clues to the kind of people who lived along the rivers. Nodina, a late Mississippian site, 
is famous for its red and white swirled clay pottery. Human head effigies found in this area may be ancient portraits. Human effigy vessels, effigy vessels in general, uh, is a likeness of a person or an animal or of a mythological creature or deity. These were very important to the Mississippian period people. It's like paying tribute to what was important to them in their ceremonial or religious beliefs, their cultural belief systems. And it also goes back and ties in to the cosmos. Archaeologists, most common interpretations, with uh, what this effigy vessel represents. One is that this could have been certainly uh, someone of status, uh, possibly in the chiefdom of the village, uh, the hereditary rule, the hierarchy. Uh, the other interpretation is that the effigy vessel could represent that of a war trophy. In the DeSoto Chronicles, it interprets for us his entrada coming in to different village sites after warfare or battle enemies' heads were on poles. Uh, so those are two common beliefs. This is recognized as one of the premier effigy head vessels known to exist in public display. There is evidence of Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto and his men encountering one of those village sites along the banks of the St. Francis River. Perkin was a, a Native American village site that was occupied from at least about 1000 AD up until after the time of DeSoto. And it's the first place in Arkansas where we have the name of a Native, Native American from Arkansas, which was Kosky. It's also the first place in Arkansas where we have definite contact between Europeans and Native Americans. And it's also the first place in Arkansas where we have record of a cross being constructed and erected and of Catholic Mass being said. When the DeSoto expedition landed in Florida in 1539, they had about oh, 600 or so members of the expedition and they ended up traveling around the whole southeastern U.S. for, for a number of years. After two years, they made it across the Mississippi River, and there's a lot of debate about where DeSoto went at different times, and we'll probably never know for sure the exact route, but we know very clearly when they crossed the Mississippi River, because by far it was the largest river they'd cross, and it was a real headache for them to get across it. Um, after they crossed that river, we're, we're certain that they were in what is now Arkansas at that time. And also, we have artifacts that we are certain came from the DeSoto expedition. They couldn't have come from anywhere else. Journal entries from the DeSoto expedition show that they may have considered Kasky's village to be an advanced civilization where people led organized, abundant lives. The Mississippian culture was built upon the foundation of rivers and river trade. And here at Parkin, the Kosky village was no different. Every aspect of their daily life would have been involved with the river, whether it be hunting and fishing, um, sending a scouting party for defense, agriculture, watering, bathing, pottery, every single thing that they did revolved around the St. Francis River. And the St. Francis River was very important, not just to the village Kosky, but to many other people as well. When De Soto visited this site in 1541, he commented that the St. Francis River was the most crystal clear river he had seen in all of the southeastern United States. And today it may not look that way, but at that time it was pristine. And with this responsibility that they had of living here in this area came a lot of negative attention as well. They did receive the benefits of having such an excellent river, but others wanted it. And that caused warfare and their eventual decline.
Whether it's encounters with visitors from another land or neighboring villages, when cultures collide, not all evidence of humanity disappears. It stays behind in the puzzle pieces left found in the dirt and in the hearts of the descendants of Arkansas's first people. A civilization reaching back as far as 800 AD roamed the Washita Mountains and spread into the Red River Valley. Several tribes known as one, the Caddo Hadacho, became who we now know as the Caddo. People are always asking me, uh, you know, who are the Caddo and where'd they come from and where are they now? And there are now about 5,000 enrolled members of the Caddo Indian Nation in Oklahoma. And we have to have the Oklahoma in there because originally the Caddo Nation, recognizing that in the old times you didn't have state boundaries, you didn't have national boundaries, you had nature's boundaries. Rivers, streams, mountains, woods, like the cross timbers that run across this part of the country. And in those days, the Caddo territory covered a vast area that would now be called southwestern Arkansas, northwestern Louisiana, northeastern Texas, and southeastern Oklahoma. So you had this big oval of an area that covered land from uh, hunting grounds and, and village sites from as far up as Hot Springs, Arkansas, down to Natchitoches, Louisiana, almost over to Waco, Texas, then up and around in Oklahoma on the cor southeast corner there and back up. Caddo people and other tribal people built mounds uh, for more than one purpose. One was to use the mound as a place for spiritual communication. With Caddo, for instance, there was always a belief in what others might call a god, what the Caddo people called the great leader above, Caddo Amo Haye. And because of that belief then, there was and is still a very strong belief that after you do not live on this earth, you go and you live in another place. Their spiritual beliefs heavily influenced their culture. The Caddo made the most of their surroundings and skills. Caddo pottery, whether ancient or modern, is distinct, unique, and tells us a lot about the tribe's skills. In 1992, I went to some museums and I saw Caddo pottery, and, it, and basically it was for the first time, and I had like in the back of my mind that we uh, did pottery way back in time and didn't see how it related to me. But what I found out was that the, the Caddo people had wonderful clay sources. They, there was a, an amazing vein of clay that ran through Nacogdoches up through Idabel, Oklahoma into Arkansas. And we really had the best clay probably in the United States. 
Jerry Redcorn, member of the Caddo Nation, has spent many years practicing and preserving her ancestors' art form. The Caddo's at that time were making, as they made clay, as they developed this clay art, they used it for ceremonies, they used it for, for daily, everything daily to store seeds, to store food, to cook. And, but as a part of it, it became a part of their life and they made some, developed some beautiful, beautiful designs. Um, they probably had the most intricate designs of any tribe in the United States at that time. And that would probably be from 500 to 700 years ago. Jerry's traditional reproductions could be used to store garden seeds, but her creations instead store memories. When I first came down here, I just, I did. I stood on the banks and I felt like crying, but I also felt like it was a significant step because I could, I was standing on the land that my great-great-grandmothers had stood on and they had gathered the clay and they had made it. Earth is important and water is important and those two things form that clay and make out of it a utilitarian vessel that we used in ceremonies, that we used in our funeral practices and in storing, you know, just in many ways. It has been such a, it's been such a wonderful thing that I am able to do this. Besides pottery, the Caddo are known for their bow making using native bow dark, also known as Osage Orangewood. Yeah, this wood is fairly crooked here, so I'm, I'm getting some spots here that are digging in so badly. I might have to scrape. This this tool here is is wonderful in being able to work the wood like this. In the far old days, they'd use flint, and I'm sure there's all kind of tricks in being able to set it just right and and use a little wedges and so forth to take off pieces of this, but. Um, that's a hard way to go. I'm, obviously, they, they knew how to do it, but without this draw knife, uh, it must have been a, uh, a whole lot harder to do. Phil Cross, Jerry Redcorn's brother, works every day to preserve Caddo tradition. That's all I've done all my life, and you know, would be doing this 24/7 almost. In fact, that's almost what I do. And in fact, shot a deer this very morning with uh, uh, one of my other bows like this, and a couple of squirrels too. So this is a this is a, a wonderful way to take a natural resource, put some human energy and knowledge and talent into it, and go do a useful exercise, I say, in hunting and uh, harvesting game. And um, being back close to nature, our, our, our cat away. Despite the inevitable push to remove Indian tribes to make way for white settlers, the Caddo maintain their customs beyond generations of forced assimilation to modern day pride and a much deserved place in Arkansas and American history. To the north of the Caddo, the Osage thrived. 
This warrior tribe hunted and camped along the rivers and streams across the Ozark Plateau. We have a very close connection to the northern half of Arkansas. But in the northern half of Arkansas, you're going to find those waterways, the water that feeds the Eureka Springs, uh, the White River, Buffalo River, those waterways, uh, the Arkansas River, that, that flow, flow in through there. The Osage, like the Caddo, knew that their lives depended on what nature provided. It's those waterways, which, which water means is life, and that's where we, we, our people situated themselves and protect themselves around those, those areas. So the northern half of Arkansas, being woodlands and coverage, to some degree out of the, the bare elements of a prairie, the abundance of food in woodlands uh, had sustainability for them and they, they could stay in that environment. The Osage, staying close to the rivers and streams, were friendly toward European trappers who passed through these areas. True of many American Indian names, the word Osage is the European version of what the native people called themselves. Osage name itself is not our original name. That was a uh, evolution of the way they identified us, the early trappers, into the Louisiana Purchase. They identified us under uh, uh, the name Wajaji, and that got uh, angelicized numerous times to where it was uh, <clears throat> Osage, and then eventually down to Osage. But our, our original name uh, goes back to the, again, those waterways. Original name, uh, Neongashka. And that, that's, again, a reference to the water. The, they try to translate that, Neongashka, in, into uh, children of the middle water. And that's a good translation for it. Before the Neongashka became the Osage, they were one part of a large tribal family. Those people, that one person, that one people broke into five different tribes. And that's where the Osage, Kaw, Quampaw, Punk, and Omaha went their separate ways. That event put the Omaha and the Ponca, they went up the Missouri to the Nebraska area, up on the that area there. And, and uh, the Kaw and the Osage went to the west into where we were, Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, and that, that Rome. And the Quapaw went south into Arkansas. And so they were down in that, that area. But we did break apart. Of that part, one part of that we became the, the Osage. And we know we were one person or one body at one time because of our language. To the east of the Osage were their cousins, the Quapaw, the downstream people. These are the people from which our state gets its name, Arkansas, Arkansas, people of the south wind. The Quapaw began a relationship with the Europeans that would result in the building of a shared history Carrie Wilson, daughter of Charles Banks Wilson, and the model of Wilson's Plains Madonna, knows that history well. Arkansas Post was, it's the Arkansas Post National Memorial down at, um, near Juliet and Dumas, Arkansas. And it was the first state capital of Arkansas, which was the first state capital of Arkansas because it was down there with the Quapaw tribe. But it was also uh, the area where Tonti settled Arkansas. It's the first settlement west of the Mississippi River. And the important thing about that is it's still there. The remains of that culture, that history is still there. And working with the Quapaw tribe, 
a few years back got a grant through the National Park Service Tribal Historic Preservation Program and we worked with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey to look for Arkansas Post and we think we've actually found it. The site is located on U.S. Fish and Wildlife land. It's maintained by both U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the National Park Service. Together, they are working to develop a preserve in that area. I think that's very important for Arkansas, and I think it's very important for Arkansans to be aware of it, to protect it, to possess it, to appreciate it, as well as the Quapaw tribe. So I really hope that, you know, sites are being destroyed, that maybe we can get a little bit more interest in, in wanting to preserve American Indian past. But it, our American Indian past in Arkansas is Arkansas's past too. The Quapaws were controlling the Mississippi River. They were a powerful people. Now, in the late 1600s, an epidemic went through, and they figure probably over 80% or more of the population died with just in a matter of a few years. So if you have over 80% of a culture die, not only do you have the deaths of those people, but you have the deaths of a culture. You're in survival mode. You're not able to remember those, those traditions, those areas, those things. You know, and it's just like what we see in African countries. When you have a large population decline and everybody's worried about where their next meal are coming from or if they're just going to live through another year, you don't, those traditions, those rich traditions that should be passed on don't. And I think that's hap that happened with the American Indian in a lot of ways. Though the Quapaw contributed a great deal to the building of Arkansas, they were pushed to other lands because of the swift encroachment of white settlers. The first removal, or what some would call purge, was to northwest Louisiana, where a third of the tribe died from starvation. Arkansas Governor George Izzard petitioned the federal government to intervene and save the remaining Quapaw. It was at that point that the Quapaws actually asked on behalf, asked the United States government on their behalf to be terminated as a tribe. We don't want to be Indians anymore. We would rather live in our beloved Arkansas than we would be to be moved someplace else. So we just don't want to be Indians anymore. We would actually like to just give us, we'll, we'll lose our recognition as a tribe and just live here like regular people. And acting Governor Crittenden said, no, we have land for you in Oklahoma. So the Quapaws removed to Oklahoma. Though these native people were forced to move from Arkansas long ago, they still refer to the natural state as home. In 2009, all three tribes were welcomed back with the opening of the historic Arkansas Museum's exhibit, We Walk in Two Worlds, the Caddo, Osage, and Quapaw in Arkansas. The stories in the exhibit are told from the native perspective and share the continuation of rich cultures. Imagine if a group of people that had a culture so different from your own just came in and settled amongst your people. And then they told you to leave and move to lands that you had never seen before. This is not one of the happier moments in American history and it needs to be remembered. Those people that lost their lives and lost their livelihood and land should be respected. The following is an excerpt from On a Spring Day by Roy Boney Jr., Cherokee artist. We don't want any children. Oh, sí, señor. 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 Oh, sí, señor.
This isn't your home anymore. ตาเฮลานะอุดาเลนะฮะตะนะฮิเมนอะโยฮุฮิสตะเลนโยนะฮิอุดาเลนะเอลอะนิซะลากิโอกิสคุยสตะเนโจกะตะเนสดิโกเ
some uh, nine years later in 1828, another treaty was uh, drafted to remove the Cherokees just uh, a few miles over across the Arkansas territorial line into Indian territory. So basically they said to the Cherokees when they backed that U-Haul up to their house in 1819, you just got off one exit off the I-40 too early. You just need to go on down across that Arkansas line, get in onto Indian territory. My grandfather told me he made the trip barefoot and often left bloody footprints in the snow. He carried a little bundle of clothing and an old flintlock rifle. J.W. Stevens, Muskogee Creek. Another of the southeastern tribes, the Muskogee Creek, has a similar story to the Cherokee. They also would have multiple journeys during removal. The first took place in 1828. The group that was removed were mainly the Lower Creeks, what they would call the Lower Creeks. They were the more Christianized people. And there was another movement uh, in 1832 that was a force removal, what I would call the force removal. And it was mostly the upper towns. They were the more traditional during that period of time. The first one was more kind of a, how would you say, that kind of a, they had more more conveniences, I guess, mm -hmm. kind of easy. Mm -hmm. But the force removal was the hardest cause. They were actually moved in the middle of winter. And that's where we lost a lot of our people. Probably close to, I think the estimate was around 8,000. Memphis Landing became the gathering place for the Chickasaw people to start their trek across Arkansas. The Chickasaws, their first um, stop, so to speak, was at Little Rock Depot. And there they were going to uh, pick up, you know, food supplies, reorganize, and begin uh, a walking route to Fort Townsend. Now, there were elderly folks and there were people who were sick that could not take the walking route to Fort Townsend. So they took a steamer down the Arkansas River to Fort Coffee. And so there was sort of a split in the tribe at that point. Um, it was here at Little Rock Depot that oral tradition tells us that one of our beloved chiefs, Chief Tishomingo, um, passed away. He was over a hundred years old and um, he uh, succumbed to an illness and is buried somewhere near Little Rock Depot. And so uh, we lost uh, a great man at that time, but we're still um, moving towards, you know, Indian Territory where we were going to have our, our new home. Now moving along the route um, the walking route, it began to rain. And the roads in Arkansas at that time were pretty primitive. And so uh, it became very muddy very quickly. And then um, most of the wagons got mired in the mud up to their axles, couldn't move very fast, and uh, people got wet. And because of the rain, it was impossible to start fires to um, dry out bedding or clothing or just to get warm. And so people came down with um, pneumonia and other illnesses along the way. And uh, people became very sick. And uh, you began to see people uh, pass away, people who died on the trail. Um, this slowed the progress even further because um, Part of the reason why they call it the Trail of Tears um, is that Indian people began to lose great numbers of family members. 
The food on the Trail of Tears was very bad and very scarce, and the Indians would go for two or three days without water, which they would get just when they came to a creek or river, as there were no wells to get water from. There were no roads to travel over, as the country was just a wilderness, and the men and women would go ahead of the wagons and cut the timber out of the way with axes. Washington Lee, Cherokee. My grandfather died on this trip. A hastily cut piece of cottonwood contained his body. The open ends were closed up and this was placed along a creek. This was not the only time this manner of burying was held, nor the only way. Some of the dead were placed between two logs and quickly covered with shrubs. Some were shoved under the thickets and some were not even buried but left by the wayside. Mary Hill, Muskogee Creek. As the southeastern tribes traveled through Arkansas, each group stopped at significant places along the way in order to reassess their supplies, health, and area climate. The sick and the elderly usually traveled by boat and the able-bodied by land. We are a National Trail of Tears historic site and we're important along the Trail of Tears because we, we're a key stop on the water route. Um, Lake Dardanelle was a key decision point for the Cherokee and other Indian tribes that were removed because they had to choose whether they were going to continue on water or continue on land to Indian territory. All of the southeastern Indian people following the various routes to their new homes in Indian territory gathered at the same place to end their Arkansas journey. We're here at Fort Smith National Historic Site and specifically we're here at the Trail of Tears Overlook. Now this is significant because all five tribes came through this area before going into Indian Territory and they received their supplies on the Trail of Tears before going into Indian Territory. The Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma calls their removal the Long Walk. Their current view of that time period is of moving forward. The philosophy that we have now, uh, we have, uh, uh, we keep repeating the, the Trail of Tears like, you know, we're, we're victim of a historical event. Well, that was then. And since that time, the Choctaw uh, has moved on. And uh, what I try to do, what I try to tell the young people is talk about the courage, the resilient spirit of the Choctaw, you know, because as long as we keep repeating, we keep uh, bringing the portrait of the Indian on horseback, you know, we're just really stereotyping ourselves again. Olin's grandmother was a basket weaver, and she used her art to teach young Olin about living among different people. So I was about maybe six years old, and uh, she sat down with me, and she was weaving a basket, and uh, she wanted to tell me about our people and the other people that we live with today. She said that the basket has different colors, just like society has different people, but if they're all woven, you know, uh, under, over, but it's, it's woven by a basket weaver, somebody that knows the design, somebody who also all, already had the picture in the mind before they even start. The road they traveled, history calls, the Trail of Tears. This trail was more than tears. It was death, sorrow, hunger, exposure, and humiliation to a civilized people. Elizabeth Watts, Cherokee. The Indian removals of the 19th century are still making an impact today. Remembering the resiliency and strength of the southeastern tribes is the key to moving forward. One of the many subjects of history is war. 
There is a warrior tradition in most American Indian tribes. The reasons for battle differ, but the aim has always been for survival and honor. In times of military combat, Native people have always been at the forefront of volunteering for the United States military, regardless of past aggression. Over the course of history, ever since the United States, you know, came to be, we have never shirked our duty as far as uh, anything that involved, you know, with the United States that you know has has had their uh, conflicts. So, and probably the Native Americans probably the first to volunteer for anything like that. My father was in the army. My uncle was in the army, and I chose to be in the Navy. <laughs> and then my uh, brother was in the army also. So that you know. It's just something I felt like I needed to do. And back in the 70s when I went in Vietnam War, it was uh, different anyway for the military because of the um, demonstrating that they were doing. So oftentimes we wouldn't get to wear our uniforms outside the base. But I, you know, I was very proud of my service to the country and that I was able to give back to what, you know, to this country based on my service. From the beginning of the United States to the present, Native people have fought for different reasons and on different sides. In our uh, history, you know, the Indians have always uh, fought, you know. If, a lot of times it was just for hunting rights, not, not uh, to say to conquer somebody, you know. I mean, we didn't want to go out and conquer you and get the best of you. We, we just fought over the, the rights to a place for, to hunt, you know. During the Revolutionary War, tribes took sides based on trade alliances. For instance, at Arkansas Post during James Colbert's raid, the Quapaw fought beside the Spanish who commanded the fort during that time. The Chickasaw took the side of the British who wanted to control the western borders of the frontier. After the Revolutionary War, skirmishes between American Indians and white settlers continued into the War of 1812. Northern tribes aided British troops in defending Canada from an invasion of United States troops. In the South, the Creek were encouraged by the British to attack settlers. Tecumseh, the great Shawnee leader, was killed in his Pan-Indian revolt to stop the expansion of the United States. Territorial conflicts surrounding Indian removal carried on into the war between the states. American Indian participation during the Civil War was influenced by geography. Tribes along the Kansas and Missouri borders tended to be Union Loyalists. The influence of government Indian agents and the need for protection from neighboring secessionist tribes were the deciding factors. The Confederacy had militias made up of different tribes whose lands bordered southern states. The so-called civilized tribes, formerly of the southeast, had adopted plantation agriculture and slavery. Economic ties to the New Orleans business market made it difficult not to side with secession. The Cherokee Nation was divided in its sympathies. Part of the tribe wanted to remain neutral but that was soon broken by pressure and promises made by the Confederates. Cherokee renegade Colonel Stand Waity led the other faction into war, such as the Battle of Pea Ridge or Elkhorn Tavern in Arkansas. One of the unique things about the Battle of Pea Ridge it was the uh, largest force of uh, uh, Indians to serve in the Confederate Army at any one time was what was here. We had uh, both the first and second mounted Cherokee rifles, although one of the regiments was no longer mounted. They had, had to give up their horses. And then we had other uh, regiments of Indians on the way to uh, support the Southern cause. They fought on the Lee Town side of the battlefield, which is uh, about three miles from here on the other side of the park. Their forces under Stan Wadey um, were uh, instrumental in uh, capturing uh, two guns of a Missouri battery. Uh, they were very surprised that they'd never seen a cannon before and um, did not quite know what to make of it. But they just realized that uh, um, they were being shelled and were charged with a large number of Texas troops towards the guns and uh, drove off the Missourians and were able to capture the cannons.
After the Civil War, the United States Congress passed the Army Reorganization Act of 1866 to expand cavalry and infantry regiments. This included the units for black enlisted men, such as the Buffalo Soldiers, and the assembly of units for Indian scouts. American Indians would typically enlist as army scouts to stay near and defend their homelands from old enemies. The army, on the other hand, saw it as an opportunity to gain strength in hostile areas and to assimilate the enlisted American Indian men. The same government that didn't allow American Indian schoolchildren to speak their tribal languages in the 19th century called upon them as adults to use those languages during World War I. For the sake of defeating Germany and saving lives, American Indian soldiers became code talkers. World War I was the first modern large-scale war and the first time American Indian boys from farms, ranches, and reservations crossed the Atlantic to fight. As far as the code talk is concerned, now I was acquainted with uh, uh, four of them, personally acquainted. One of them was my uncle, James Edwards. The United States military asked men from six American Indian tribes to memorize code based on their tribal languages to transmit messages about troop movements in the field. The Choctaw language confused German intercept operatives, and the tactic brought a quicker end to a brutal war. Choctaw elder and World War II Navy veteran Bertram Bob tells of his uncle's military service in the Great War. Whenever a group of Choctaws get together, they have a good time. They just talk and talk in their own language and laugh and play around and kid each other. and. Uh, uh, the officer saw them out there and says, what are y'all talking? And James Edwards says, uh, uh, we're talking Choctaw. That's our, that's our language. He says, how many of you got in the company here? Oh, we got in the whole company here, 18, 20. And, uh, and so uh, the officer there got the idea that they could uh, use them, maybe someplace. So they uh, asked them to come and and to talk uh, Choctaw to them and to train them to talk on the phones and uh, uh, relay messages. The U.S. involvement over there in World War I was brief compared to Allied forces, though not without tremendous impact. American Indian code talkers became a surprise secret weapon. In October 1918, the U.S. Army's 36th Division transmitted open messages about troop movements in France. The messages in several tribal languages confused the Germans and helped get aid to French forces. Nearly a century later, in 1989, France honored the Choctaw Code Talkers with France's Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite for the importance of their contributions to ending the war. Code Talker units continued to be used into World War II with the addition of 11 more tribal languages. Prior to the Korean conflict, the military was segregated Examples of this are the all African-American Tuskegee Airmen, the Japanese-American 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, and the American Indian Code Talkers. In 1948, President Truman desegregated the military by signing Executive Order 9981, 
establishing the President's Committee on Equality of Treatment and Opportunity in the Armed Services. Integration was set in motion, allowing races to mix within basic training and units. One common trait that American Indians share is perseverance. Native people have been driven to survive and to do so with honor. It is no surprise that the volunteerism for military service accelerated with each call to duty. These patriots are celebrated and remembered with ceremony. I don't know if you've seen, but uh, right south of that building, we have a monument. And it's the uh, men and women that were served in the armed forces. There's two parts of the monument, front and back, that are covered with names of people that are, are still here today and some that have passed on. We have a lot of tradition in carrying on our service uh, to our country. The new Muskogee Creek Nation Veterans Museum mixes United States military tradition with that of tribal symbolism in the design of the special building. The exhibit portion of the museum surrounds a pentagon-shaped center that has an open roof, similar to a smoke hole in an ancient dwelling. On the floor of this courtyard of sorts are the seals of the five branches of the military. It's a place for veterans and their families to reflect. If you notice, as you came into the, uh, to the museum, you saw a bronze statue out there, uh, symbolic of the past and the present, the warrior standing behind the present soldier. You know, we always look at the past and the future, and we never do anything without first sometime looking at where we came from. And when we can go back to look at where we come from, it really gives us a strong direction of where we're going as well. And it never hurts our people to look back on where we've been, what we've done, the accomplishments that have been done and, and experienced by, by veterans and their families and even our nation. So we have a lot to be thankful for. In the brightest day, in the darkest night, no evil shall escape my sight, for I am the Shadow Wolf. Service to the United States comes in many forms. Since the early 1970s, a special unit of U.S. Immigration and Customs, now in the Department of Homeland Security, has protected the border between the United States and Mexico. Originally developed to control the trafficking of marijuana from Mexico into and across reservation land, the Shadow Wolves, as they are called, are a select group of American Indian trackers. Representing eight different tribal nations, these Border Patrol officers track drug smugglers using a traditional method called cutting for sign. Using a wolf pack style approach, officers look for threads of clothing, footprints, tire tracks, anything odd that stands out in the Arizona desert. Though this unit has the latest high-tech gear, they rely heavily on the method of paying attention to detail. The Shadow Wolves have trained border guards and custom agents around the world to use the same techniques. Recently, this unit trained regional border guards in Afghanistan and Pakistan to track terrorists. It is well recognized that historically, Native Americans have the highest record of service per capita when compared to other ethnic groups. The reasons behind this disproportionate contribution are complex and deeply rooted in traditional American Indian culture. In many respects, Native Americans are no different from others who volunteer for military service. They do, however, 
have distinctive cultural values which drive them to serve their country. One such value is their proud warrior tradition. No one hates war more than a soldier. But with warriors, there is a need to protect, and the call overrides the fear. A blurry combination of fact, fiction, and theory breeds misinformation. Stereotypes concerning American Indians are perpetuated due to lack of knowledge. Native people have struggled to maintain cultural identity while being forced to fit into a one-size-fits-all mold. Preservation of culture is part of counteracting misconceptions and maintaining tribal individuality while being part of the group called American Indians. Hate no one, hate no one. 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 Hate no one, yawa nekete. Hate no one. Generations of people have visited hot springs to bathe in the thermal waters of the Washita Mountains. Advertising for the baths relied heavily on the legend that this was a sacred American Indian meeting place. Oh, the granddaddy or champion myth is that this was neutral ground for all of the Indians, um, the Valley of Peace, and that uh, you know everybody who came here would lay down their tomahawk and bathe together peaceably uh, here in the valley, no matter what their grudges might have been against each other elsewhere. Is it true or not? Although a valley of peace is a pleasant idea, there is no archaeological evidence or reliable source to back up the story. Modern tribes share no oral tradition of these events in Hot Springs. Theories and myths are the only results. The Indian tribes have a special expertise when it comes to uh, uh, interpreting uh, their own culture. And this expertise can only come from uh, being raised within that culture, being raised within that tribe. The, uh, uh, and th this information cannot be learned in school or gleaned from the archaeological record. Uh, and in many cases, these traditions may uh, span uh, Span centuries uh, may go back into prehistoric times. So by tapping into this, this uh, by consulting with the tribes and by tapping into this uh, uh, this knowledge base, uh, it may give archaeologists uh, uh, the the information that they need to at least better interpret some of these things that we can really only speculate about now. Modern American Indian tribes have more than their ancestors' oral traditions to guide them through the past. Many have historic preservation offices that work with various agencies, such as the National Park Service, to protect tribal and ancestral lands. These areas often have cultural and religious significance. The National Historic Preservation Act was created in 1966 for the care of threatened cultural resources across the United States. Over the years, amendments have been made to give individual responsibility and control to American Indian nations, like the Caddo. We're in a process of uh, repatriating our ancestors from Arkansas, from around Lake Millwood, through uh, the Little Rock Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have 82 Caddo ancestors, along with their uh, funerary items that were removed back in the 50s when the lake was being built. Uh, an area has been located there at Lake Millwood for a reinterment area and hopefully uh, someday soon we can rebury our ancestors back in an area that they were removed from and, and be protected and like any other uh, you know any other individual out there in, that would want their grandmother or grandfather or brother or sister protected, you know, and, and put them back in a respectful way. In 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, 
was introduced into federal law as a way to protect ancestral human remains and burial objects. Arkansas has its own law giving the same protection to public and private land and water. NAGPRA uh, is a very, very important law that was passed for not just the Choctaw, but all Indian people. Right now, today, I think we have Choctaw remains uh, over 2,000 that's still in the museums. They are in paper sacks, cardboard boxes on shelves. It's really a sad deal, uh, and that's just the Choctaws. They're, they're, all the other tribes have the same uh, issues that they're, they're dealing with. The administrators have already signed. Some American Indian Historic Preservation Officers have tried to form multi-tribal groups to make the NAGPRA process more efficient. Unfortunately, those efforts have been denied, but the work continues. Little by little, ancestors and sacred objects are reburied in keep-safe cemeteries on protected land. Our first uh, reburial was a museum that uh, had one of our Choctaw warriors on display back before the law came about. In fact, they, they titled the uh, display as a Choctaw warrior. So we, uh, we brought him home and reburied him. Had a nice ceremony for him. For princess. Well, no, for princess to put for princess. But what do we do now? So Preserving culture doesn't just mean finding artifacts and reburying ancestors. American Indian identity is surviving by teaching others through technology and working in communities. Culture camps, news organizations, and language programs are strengthening individual tribes. Every year, the United Kutua Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma has a culture camp during spring break. Children from area communities in Northeast Oklahoma play traditional games, listen to stories, and make baskets and corn husk dolls. Cherokee elders share history, culture, and personal experiences. Sharing and preserving information on a larger scale began with the first tribal newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, which started circulation in 1828. Many American Indian tribes have newspapers that print a wide range of stories and important information. Several of these newspapers are collected by the American Native Press Archives at the Sequoia National Research Center in Arkansas. Other outlets include television. The Muscogee Creek Nation Communications Department broadcasts a weekly program called Native News Today. The stories range from politics to tribal enterprises to high school events, public service announcements about continuing education lectures, and stop smoking campaigns run between stories. It looks like MC Butts has got beat down, and I knew there was something smelly about this dance-off competition, and it was MC Butts. Now, and, uh, we look All of this the, uh, information sharing is part of preservation. To the, one of the of the Language sharing through writing and speaking keeps history and culture alive. Choctaw is one of our largest member of our Muscogean speaking people, our Muscogean language people. And back in history, I guess they can go back as far as 2000 BC when uh, uh, Choctaws were in the Southeast, uh, I guess the mound builders, I don't know if, they, if it was the Choctaws, but it was the Muscogean speaking people. But uh, we share these languages with uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, Alabama, Cushadas, Homa, and Tunica, Biloxi. You know, they're all in the southeast uh, United States. So uh, I think the European, when they came through there around 1600 to 1500, uh, this is what they were hearing. And uh, they uh, fixed a book out where this is what they heard, and it's, I think it's a 1,200-word dictionary, what they call Mobilian Dictionary, and I think we have uh, 
1,250 uh, word in 80% are Choctaws, but the spelling are in European or the English, you know, like a phonics, what, this is what they heard. And so this area is in uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, Florida. You can see all the Choctaw words all through there. I call it Choctaw because, you know, it's still a Muscogean. Cherokee culture is, uh, it means a lot of things to, to a lot of different people. Um, I think uh, it's most readily seen in the language and hearing, uh, hearing the people that uh, remember Cherokee as a first language and still use it. Um, and that's where you see the culture through these people, most evident. Um, but culture is also the history. Um, there is a rich and long history of uh, Cherokee culture that goes back um, well before uh, the arrival of the Europeans here, um, but certainly it begins being recorded in you know, the 1540s uh, uh, when uh, the Spanish explorers are first encountering uh, southeastern Indians. I work at Cherokee Nation's Education Department and we make uh, multimedia work in the Cherokee language. Um, so we've uh, started doing, um, getting the ability to put websites all in Cherokee, um, doing uh, interactive media such as um, versions of Facebook and um, MySpace, but it's all um, in Cherokee. American Indian languages are disappearing even though tribes like the Cherokee Nation have large numbers of native speakers. The Cherokee Immersion School is teaching the Cherokee language by using everyday technology and activities. What we're trying to do is give it the ability to use technology and if a kid's wanting to uh, be on the internet and social network with each other, they can do that, but they can do it in Cherokee now. And um, the department I work with, uh, Roy uh, Boney Jr. and myself, and. We've been uh, developing with Apple and uh, Chris Harvey from Canada, Language Geek, um, to make text messaging in Cherokee. And that way our kids will be able to text message just like every other kids are able to do, but it can be in our language. Sharing cultures with communities electronically or face-to-face -face can plant the seeds for wider understanding. The learning goes beyond a textbook Workshops and exhibits can foster a sense of kinship. Native web media gives immediate cultural perspective and opinion. So the Indian Country Communications Business Hub is about uh, communication, uh, education, uh, literature enhancements of uh, uh, the native perspective and trying to get that information out to the world and respond to the need for information about uh, American Indians and actually indigenous people in the Western hemis Hemisphere for the most part. The range of information is tremendous. Paul has added short, one-on-one -on -one interviews about American Indian issues to Indian Country News. These pieces are then posted online under the link Indian Country TV. Locally, the Sequoia National Research Center at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock holds annual symposia to give Native people a forum to network and for the public to learn about American Indian issues. We uh, invite about 20 indigenous speakers from the U.S. and Canada each year to come in and uh, talk to the public and, and all of our, our events are open to the public. This is one of the most successful op, uh, activities that we've performed. And what we wanted to do with this was to uh, have a, a forum that would be open to indigenous speakers who could come in and, and talk about what issues they wanted to, what they thought was you know, important in Indian country. Some non-Native people are hesitant to ask Native people about their backgrounds. In different groups and in different regions of the United States, Native people are referred to as American Indian, Native American, Indigenous people, Native people, 
and unfortunately, racial slurs. If you wonder how to address someone who is American Indian, respectfully ask about their background. Tribal identity is important, and using stereotypes is ridiculous. Almost every day, somebody will ask me if I'm Native American, and I'll tell them yes, I'm of the Choctaw Nation. And uh, a lot of times the question is, do you live in a teepee? Uh, and uh, I say, no. I've got a log house that uh, resembles a teepee. It's got cathedral ceilings, but uh, it's not a teepee. And uh, so I appreciate the AET in doing these uh, videos, explaining to not only the children, but their parents, everybody in Arkansas, that uh, it's not the way it was in the 1800s with the Native Americans, that uh, we too have changed and we're part of the community as far as helping with other people. Today we're here at Fort Smith National. Approximately 1% of the population of the United States is listed as American Indian. One third live on reservations or in native communities. The majority of the population live across the country, working in every industry and living in every kind of neighborhood. American Indian identity in the 21st century is extremely important. Um, you know, we're still here, you know, we're still here. And we do a myriad of things, you know. Uh, you know, Indian country, there's, there's really no such thing as Indian country, you know, because there's not one place you can go to and say, this is how Indians are, you know. Uh, we're all over, you know, and we're part, we're woven into the fabric of diversity that is the United States of America. You know, we're the... I think we're probably one of the first threads.